Chapter 23 The Fall of Balancing Rock Through tear-blurred sight, Jane Witherstein watched Venners and Elizabeth Earn and the black racers disappear over the ridge of sage. They're gone, said Lassiter, and they're safe now. And there'll never be a day in their coming happy lives but they'll remember Jane Witherstein and, and Uncle Jim. I reckon, Jane, we'd better be on our way. The burrows obediently wheeled and started down the break with little cautious steps, but Lassiter had to leash the wanting dogs and lead them. Jane felt herself bound in a feeling that was neither listlessness nor indifference, yet which rendered her incapable of interest. She was still strong in body, but emotionally tired. That hour at the entrance to Deception Pass had been the climax of her suffering, the flood of her wrath, the last of her sacrifice, the extremity of her love, and the attainment of peace. She thought that if she had little faith, she would not ask any more of life. Like an automaton, she followed Lassiter down the steep trail of dust and bits of weathered stone, and when the little slides moved with her or piled around her knees, she experienced no alarm. Vague relief came to her in the sense of being enclosed between dark stone walls, deep hidden from the glare of the sun, from the glistening sage. Lassiter lengthened the stirrup straps on one of the burrows and bade her mount and ride close to him. She was to keep the burrow from cracking his little hard hooves on the stones. Then she was riding on between dark gleaming walls. There were quiet and rest and coolness in this canyon. She noticed indifferently that they passed under shady, bulging shelves of cliff, through patches of grass and sage and thicket and groves of slender trees, and over white pebbly washes and round masses of broken rock. The burrows trotted tirelessly, the dogs once more free, pattered tirelessly, and Lassiter led on with never a stop, and at every open space he looked back. The shade under the walls gave place to sunlight, and presently they came to a dense thicket of slender trees through which they passed to rich green grass and water. Here Lassiter rested the burrows for a little while, but he was restless, uneasy, silent, always listening, peering under the trees. She dully reflected that enemies were behind them, before them. Still the thought awakened, no dread or concern or interest. At his bidding she mounted and rode on close to the heels of his burrow. The canyon narrowed, the walls lifted the ragged rims higher, and the sun shone down hot from the center of the blue stream of sky above. Lassiter traveled slower, with more exceeding care as to the ground he chose, and he kept speaking low to the dogs. They were now hunting dogs, keen, alert, suspicious, sniffing the warm breeze. The monotony of the yellow walls broke in change of color and smooth surface and the ragged outline of rims grew craggy. Splits appeared in deep breaks and gorges running at right angles, and then the pass opened wide at a junction of intersecting canyons. Lassiter dismounted, led his burrow, called the dogs close, and proceeded at a snail's pace through dark masses of rock and dense thickets under the left wall. Long he watched and listened before venturing to cross the mouths of the side canyons. At length he halted, led his burrow, lifted a warning hand to Jane, and then slipped away among the boulders, and, followed by the stealthy dogs, disappeared from sight. The time he remained absent was neither short nor long to Jane Witherstein. When he reached her side again he was pale, and his lips were set in a hard line, and his gray eyes glittered coldly. Bidding her dismount, he led the burrows into a culvert of stones and cedars and tied them. "'Jane, I've run into fellers I've been looking for, and I'm going after them,' he said. "'Why?' she asked. I reckon I won't take the time to tell you. Couldn't we slip by without being seen? Likely enough, but that ain't my game, and I'd like to know, in case I don't come back, what you'll do. What can I do? I reckon you can go back to Toll, or stay in the pass, and be taken off by rustlers. Which will you do? I don't know. I can't think very well, but I believe I'd rather be taken off by rustlers. Lassiter sat down, put his head in his hands, and remained for a few moments, in what appeared to be deep and painful thought. When he lifted his face, it was haggard, lined, cold as sculptured marble. I'll go. I only mentioned that chance of my not coming back. I'm pretty sure to come. Need you risk so much? Must you fight more? Haven't you shed enough blood? I'd like to tell you why I'm going, he continued, in coldness he had seldom used to her. She remarked it, but it was the same to her as if she had spoken with his old gentle warmth. But I reckon I won't. 
Only I'll say that mercy and goodness, such as is in you, though they're grand things in human nature, can't be lived up to on this Utah border. Life's hell out here. You think, or you used to think, that your religion made this life heaven. Maybe them scales on your eyes have dropped now. Jane, I wouldn't have you no different, and that's why I'm going to try to hide you somewhere in this past. I'd like to hide many more women, for I've come to see there are more like you among your people. And I'd like you to see just how hard and cruel this border life is. It's bloody. you think churches and churchmen would make it better. They make it worse. You give names to things. Bishops, elders, ministers, Mormonism, duty, faith, glory. You dream, or you're driven mad. I'm a man, and I know. I name fanatics, followers, blind women, oppressors, thieves, rustlers, ranchers, riders. And we have what you've lived through these last months. It can't be helped, but it can't last always. And remember this. Some day the border will be better, cleaner, with ways of men like Lassiter. She saw him shake his tall form erect and look at her strangely and steadfastly and then noiselessly, stealthily slip away amid the rocks and trees. Bring him Whitey, not being bidden to follow, remained with Jane. She felt extreme weariness, yet somehow it did not seem to be of her body. She sat down in the shade and tried to think. She saw a creeping lizard, cactus flowers, the drooping burrows, the rusting dogs, an eagle high over a yellow crag. Once the meanest flower, a color, the flight of a bee, or any living thing had given her deepest joy. Lassiter had gone off, yielding to his incurable bloodlust, probably to his own death. And she was sorry, but there was no feeling in her sorrow. Suddenly from the mouth of the canyon, just beyond her, rang out a clear, sharp report of a rifle. Echoes clapped, then followed a piercing high yell of anguish, quickly breaking. Again echoes clapped, in grim imitation. Dull revolver shots, hoarse yells, pounds of hoofs, shrill neighs of horses, commingling of echoes, and again silence. Lassiter must be busily engaged, thought Jane, and no chill trembled over her. No blanching tightened her skin. Yes, the border was a bloody place, but life had always been bloody. Men were blood spillers. Phases of the history of the world flashed through her mind. Greek and Roman wars, dark medieval times, the crimes in the name of religion. On sea, on land, everywhere, shooting, stabbing, cursing, clashing, fighting men. Greed, power, oppression, fanaticism, love, hate, revenge, justice, freedom. For these, men killed one another. She lay there under the cedars, grazing up through the delicate lace-like foliage of the blue sky, and she thought and wondered and did not care. More rattling shots disturbed the noonday quiet. She heard a sliding of weathered rock, a hoarse shout of warning, a yell of alarm, Again, the clear, sharp crack of a rifle, and another cry that was the cry of death. The rifle reports pierced a dull volley of revolver shots. Bullets whizzed over Jane's hiding place. One struck a stone and whined away in the air. After that, for a time, succeeded dulcetory shots, and then they seized under long, thundering fire from heavier guns. Sooner or later, then, Jane heard the cracking of horses' hoofs on stones, and the sound came nearer and nearer. Silence intervened until Lazarus' soft, jingling step assured her of his approach. When he appeared, he was covered with blood. All right, Jane, he said, I come back, and don't worry. With water from a canteen, he washed the blood from his face and hands. Jane, hurry now. Tear my scarf in two and tie up these places. That hole through my hand is some inconvenient. Worse than this over my ear. There, you're doing fine. Not a bit nervous, no trembling. I reckon I ain't done your courage justice. I'm glad you're brave just now, and you'll need to be. Well, I was hid pretty good, enough to keep em from shooting at me deep, but they was slinging lead close all the time. I used up all the rifle shells, and I went after them. Maybe you heard. It was then I got hit. Had to use up every shell on my own gun, and they did too, as I seen. Rustlers and Mormons, Jane. Now I'm packing five bullet holes in my carcass and guns without shells. Hurry now. He unstrapped the saddlebags from the burrows. Slipped his saddles and let them lie, turned the burrows loose, and calling the dogs, led the way through stones and cedars to an open where two horses stood. Jane, are you strong? I think so. I'm not tired, Jane replied. I don't mean that way. Can you bear up? I think I can bear anything. I reckon you look a little cold and thick, so I'm preparing you. For what? I didn't want to tell you why I just had to go after them fellows. I couldn't tell you. I believe you would have died, but I can tell you now if you'll bear up under a shock. Go on, my friend. I've got little Fay alive, bad hurt, but she'll live. Jane Witherstein's deadlock feeling, rent by Lassiter's deep quivering voice, leaped into an agony of sensitive life. 
Here, he added, and showed her where little Fay lay on the grass. Unable to speak, unable to stand, Jane dropped to her knees. By that long, beautiful golden hair, Jane recognized the beloved Fay. But Fay's loveliness was gone. Her face was drawn and looked old with grief. But she was not dead. Her heartbeat, and Jane Witherstein, gathered her strength and lived again. You see, I just had to go after Faye, Lassiter was saying as he knelt to bathe her little pale face, but I reckon I didn't want no choices like the one I had to make. There was a crippled feller in that bunch, Jane. Maybe Venner's crippled him. Anyway, that's why they were holding up there. I had seen little Faye's first thing, and that was hard to put it to figure out a way to get her, and I wanted hosses, too. I had to take chances. So I crawled close to their camp. One feller jumped the hoss with little Faye, and when I shot him, of course, she dropped. She stunned and bruised. She fell right on her head, Jane. She's coming, too. She ain't bad hurt. Faye's long lashes fluttered. Her eyes opened. At first they seemed glazed over. They looked dazed by pain. Then they quickened, darkened to shine with intelligence. Bewilderment, memory, and sudden wonderful joy. Mother, Jane, she whispered. Oh, little Faye, little Faye, cried Jane, lifting, clasping the child to her. And now we've got to rustle, said Lassiter with grim coolness. Jane, look down the pass. Across the mounds of rock and sage, Jane caught sight of a band of riders falling up out of the narrow neck of the pass, and in lead was a white horse, which even at a distance of a mile or more she knew. Tall, she almost screamed. I reckon, but Jane, we've still got the game in our hands. They're riding tired horses. Venner's likely gave them a chase. He wouldn't forget that, and we've fresh hosses. Hurriedly, he strapped on the saddlebags, gave a quick glance to girths and cinches and stirrups, then leaped astride. Lift little Faye up, he said. With shaking arms, Jane complied. Get back your nerve, woman. This is life and death now. Mind that. Climb up. Keep your wits. Stick close to me. Watch where your hoss is going and ride. Somehow Jane mounted. Somehow found the strength to hold the reins, to spur, to cling on to ride. A horrible quaking, craven fear possessed her soul. Blaster led the swift flight across the wide space, over washes through sage, down an air canyon, where the rapid clutter of hooves rapped sharply from the walls. The wind roared in her ears. The gleaming cliff swept by. Trail and sage and grass moved under her. Lassiter's bandaged, blood-stained face turned to her. He shouted encouragement. He looked back down the pass. He spurred his horse. Jane clung on, spurring likewise, and the horses settled from hard, furious gallop into a long, driving run. She had never ridden at anything like that pace. Desperately, she tried to get the swing of the horse to be of some help to him in that race to see the best of the ground and to guide him into it, but she failed with everything except to keep her seat in the saddle and to spur and spur. At times she closed her eyes, unable to bear the sight of Faye's golden curls streaming in the wind. She could not pray, she could not rail. She no longer cared for herself. All of life, of good, of use in the world, of hope in heaven, entered in Lassiter's ride with little Faye to safety. She would have tried to turn the iron-jawed brute she rode. She would have given herself to that relentless, dark-browed toll but she knew Lassiter would turn with her, so she rode on and on. Whether that run was of moments or hours, Jane Witherstein could not tell. Lassiter's horse covered her with froth that blew back in white streams. Both horses ran their limit, were allowed to slow down in time to save them, and went on dripping, heaving, staggering. Oh, Lassiter, we must run, we must run. He looked back, saying nothing. The bandage had blown from his head, the blood trickled down his face. He was bowing under the strain of injuries, of the ride, of his burden. Yet how cool and gay he looked, how intrepid. The horses walked, trotted, galloped, ran, to fall again to walk. Hours sped or dragged. Time was an instant and an eternity. Jane Witherstein felt hell pursuing her, and dared not look back for fear she would fall from her horse. A oh, Lassiter, is he coming? The grim rider looked over his shoulder, but said no word. Faye's golden hair floated on the breeze. The sun shone, the walls gleamed, the sage glistened. And then it seemed the sun vanished, the walls shaded, and the sage paled. The horses walked, trotted, galloped, ran, to fall back again to walk. Shadows gathered under shelving cliffs. The canyon turned, brightened, opened into a long, wide, wall-enclosed valley. Again the sun, lowering in the west, reddened the sage. Far ahead round, scrawled stone appeared to block the pass. Bear up, Jane, bear up, called Lassiter. It's our game if you don't weaken. Lassiter, go on alone. Save little Fay. Only with you. Oh, I'm a coward, a miserable coward. I can't fight or think or hope or pray. I'm lost. Oh, Lassiter, look back. Is he coming? I'll not hold out. Keep your breath, woman, and ride not for yourself or for me, but for Fay. A last breaking run across the sage brought Lassiter's horse to a walk. He's done, said the rider. 
Oh, no, no, moaned Jane. Look back, Jane, look back. Three or four miles we've come across this valley, and no tool yet in sight. Only a few more miles. Jane looked back over the long stretches of sage and found a narrow gap in the wall, out of which came a file of dark horses with white horse in the lead. The sight of the riders acted upon Jane as a stimulant. The weight of cold, horrible terror lessened, and gazing forward at the dogs, at Lazarus' limping horse, at the blood on his face, at the rocks growing nearer, at last face golden hair, the ice left her veins, and slowly, strangely, she gained hold of strength that she believed would see her to the safety Lassiter promised, and as she gazed, Lassiter's horse stumbled and fell. He swung his leg and slipped from the saddle. Jane, take the child, he said, and lifted Fay up. Jane clasped her arms suddenly strong. Their gaining went on Lassiter as he watched the pursuing riders, but we'll beat him yet. Turning with Jane's bride on his hand, he was about to start when he saw the saddlebag on the fallen horse. I've just about got time, he muttered, and with swift fingers that did not blunder or fumble, he loosened the bag and threw it over his shoulder. Then he started to run, leading Jane's horse, and he ran, trotted, walked, and ran again. Close ahead now, Jane saw a rise of bare rock. Lassiter reached it, searched along the base, and finding a low place, dragged the weary horse up and over a round smooth stone. Looking backward, Jane saw Tall's white horse not a mile distance, with riders strung out in a long line behind him. Looking forward, she saw more valley to the right, and to the left a towering cliff. Lassiter pulled the horse and kept on. Little Fay lay in her arms with wide open eyes, eyes that were still shattered by pain, but no longer fixed, glazed in terror. The golden curls blew across Jane's lips. The little hands feebly clasped her arm. A ghost of a troubled, trustful smile hovered around her sweet lips, and Jane Withestine awoke to the spirit of a lioness. Lassiter was leading the horse up a smooth slope toward the cedar trees of twisted, bleached appearance. Among these he halted. Jane, give me the girl and get down, he said, as if it wrenched him. He unbuckled the empty black guns with a strange air of finality. He then received Faye in his arms and stood a moment, looking backward. Toll's white horse mounted the ridge of a round stone, and several bays or blacks followed. I wonder what he'll think when he sees them empty guns. Jane, bring your saddle bag and climb after me. A glistening, wonderful bare slope with little holes swelled up and up to lose itself in a frowning yellow cliff. Jane closely watched her steps and climbed behind Lassiter. He moved slowly. Perhaps he was only husbanding his strength. But she saw drops of blood on the stone, and then she knew. They climbed and climbed without looking back. Her breast labored. She began to feel as if little points of fiery steel were penetrating her side and into her lungs. She heard the panning of Lassiter and the quicker panning of the dogs. Wait, here, he said. Before her rose a bulge of stone, nicked with little cut steps, and above that a corner of yellow wall, and overhanging that a vast ponderous cliff. The dogs pattered up, disappeared round the corner. Lassiter mounted the steps with Fay, and he swung like a drunken man, and he too disappeared. But instantly he returned alone and half ran, half slipped down to her. Then from below peeled up hoarse shouts of angry men. Tall and several of his riders had reached the spot where Lassiter had parted with his guns. You'll need that breath, maybe, said Lassiter, looking downward with glittering eyes. Now, Jane, the last pole, he went on. Walk up the little steps. I'll follow and steady you. Don't think. Just go. Little face above. Her eyes are open. She just said to me, Where's Mother Jane? Without a fear or tremor or a slip or a touch of Lassiter's hand, Jane Witherstein walked up that ladder of cut steps. He pushed her round the corner of the wall. Fay lay with wide staring eyes in the shade of a gloomy wall. The dogs waited. Lassiter picked up the child and turned into a dark cleft. It zigzagged. It widened. It opened. Jane was amazed at a wonderfully smooth and steep incline leading up between ruined, splintered, toppling walls. A red haze from the setting sun filled this passage. Lassiter climbed with slow measured steps, and blood dripped from him to make splotches on the white stone. Jane tried not to step in his blood, but was compelled, for she found no other footing. The saddle bag began to drag her down. She gasped for breath. She thought her heart was bursting. Slower, slower yet the rider climbed, whistling as he breathed. The incline widened. Huge pinnacles and monuments of stone stood alone, leaning fearfully. Red sunset haze shone through the cracks where the wall had split. Jane did not look high, but she felt the overshadowing of broken rooms above. She felt that it was a fearful, menacing place, and she climbed on in heart-rending effort, and she fell beside Lassiter and Fay at the top of the incline in a narrow, smooth divide. He staggered to his feet, staggered to a huge leaning rock that rested on a small pedestal. He put his hand on it. 
the hand that had been shot through, and Jane saw blood drip from the ragged hole. Then he fell. Jane, I can't do it, he whispered. What? Roll the stone. All my life I've loved to roll stones, and now I, I can't. What of it? You talk strangely. Why roll that stone? I plan to fetch you here to roll this stone. See? It'll smash the crags, loosen the walls, close the inlet. As Dame Witherstein gazed down that long incline, walled in by crumbling cliffs, waiting only the slightest jar to make them fall asunder, she saw Tall peer at the bottom and began to climb. A rider followed him, another, and another. See, Tall, the riders. Yes, they'll get us now. Why? Haven't you the strength left to roll the stone? Jane, it ain't that. I've lost my nerve. You, Lassiter, I wanted to roll at Mentu, but I can't. Fenner's Valley is down behind here. We could live there, but if I roll the stone, we're shut in for always. I don't dare. I'm thinking of you. Lassiter, roll the stone, she cried. He rose, tottering, but with set face, and again he placed a bloody hand on a balancing rock. Jane Witherstein gazed from him down the passage. Toll was climbing. Almost, she thought, she saw his dark, relentless face. Behind him, more riders climbed. What did they mean for Fay, for Lassiter, for herself? Roll the stone, Lassiter, I love you. Under all his deathly pallor, and the blood and the iron of seared cheek and lined brow, worked a great change. He placed both hands on the rock, and then leaned his shoulder there and braced his powerful body. Roll the stone! It stirred, it groaned, it grated, it moved, and with a slow grinding, as of wrathful relief, began to lean. It had waited ages to fall, and now was slow in starting. Then, as if suddenly, instinct with life, it leaped hurtlingly down to alight on the steep incline, to bound more swiftly into the air, to gather momentum, to plunge into the lofty, leaning crag below. The crag thundered into atoms, a wave of air, a splitting shock. Dust surrounded the red sunset with shaking rims. Dust surrounded Tull as he fell on his knees with uplifted arms. Shafts and monuments and sections of wall fell majestically. From the depths there rose a long, drawn, rumbling roar. The outlet to deception passed closed forever. End of Riders of the Purple Sage